morning. We're in week two of a series called Managing My Monsters. Now, the whole idea of this message came from a truth that I experienced about my personal life. Now, listen, when I discovered about this truth about my personal life, I didn't like it, but it didn't make it any less truth. And here's the truth that I discovered. Underneath this thin layer of politeness, under this thin layer of civility, lay some monsters that lurk underneath that are always trying to escape in my life. And these monsters that I discovered, well, they all have names like anger and greed and lust and envy and jealousy and pride and selfishness. And last week, we had to admit a hard truth, but we did it together. And here's the hard truth that we admitted last week if you weren't here. Our inner monster will escape. Our inner monster will escape. And in a moment, we cause a mountain of damage. And here's what we looked at last week if you weren't here. When our monsters escape, it only takes a moment and then there is a mountain of damage. And here's why this is so important because the consequences are devastating. And last week we talked about what are the consequences when our monsters get out and it's that we create dislike in our coworkers, we create hostility in our friends, we create resentment in our spouses and we create bitterness in our children. And listen, whether you have no faith or different faith or you've grown up in your church, no one wants this in their life. And then along comes Jesus and he tells us a singular truth that we discovered last week, and it's this, that if we don't manage our monsters, they will manage us. We don't have to like this truth. We don't even have to believe this truth, but it is true whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not. If we don't manage our monsters, our monsters will manage us. And so today I had this hope. I had this hope to talk about one monster in particular. And there's a reason why I chose this one monster. And the reason I chose to talk about this one monster today is because it made my top three list. And you might be going, Matt, what is a top three list? And I kind of keep a running list. If I could go back 25 or 30 years ago and tell my younger self something, what would I tell them? And this monster made the top three list. If I could go back and speak to my younger self, I would grab my younger self and say, you have to manage this monster. Because over the last two plus decades, as a leader, as a pastor, as a husband, as a friend, I've seen this monster inflict untold damage. And the monster is the monster of anger. It was my daughter's 13th birthday. And I had planned an amazing birthday, even if I say so myself. It was a 13th birthday and my daughter was young and my daughter was into birds. And, and for her, her Christmas and now around her 10th birthday, she was born in February, we had gotten her this little bird and she had a bird and she liked all kinds of birds. And so we had planned a whole day. We were leaving early in the morning. We were driving from Maryland to Virginia to go to this one pet store that had these giant birds and all kinds of birds. And we're gonna do that. Then we're gonna go to lunch. Then we're gonna go to this bird store and we're gonna buy some stuff. Then we're gonna go out to dinner and come home. It was an amazing day that I had planned out. And so we drove for hours. Hours. We finally got to this pet store. We saw these beautiful giant birds and we spent hours in a bird store. And you know, I feel like that's a good dad. When you spend hours looking at birds, like once I've seen a bird, I'm like, yeah, it's a bird. It flies, it squawks, it poops. Yeah. But my daughter loved birds. So I, I was, I stayed at the bird store and I oohed and I awed and we looked at stuff and it was cool. Right. And then after that, we went and had lunch and then we tried to find this, this store that was a specialty bird store, but apparently no one had told us that it had gone out of business. And so we drived around the same place for about an hour and that was just thrilling and exciting. Right. And we finally, we realized it was out of business, but we found another store and then we bought my daughter some bird seed and we bought her bird, a bird toy. And then we went out to dinner and then we came home, we had cake. And then right at the end of the day, my da daughter said, Dad, can you build Cheeky's bird toy? To what's at eight o'clock after a long day, all dads go, sure, it's your birthday. So she grabs her bird and she brings the bird over to the table. The table's all cleared off and I'm making the little bird thing and my wife is over there doing something and one daughter's talking and they're laughing and no one's really at the table helping me do this. I'm, I'm doing it all by myself um, and I'm putting the bird toy together and the little bird, my daughter's bird that she had gotten a couple years ago, came over and it kind of like I pecked at my hand as I was putting 
the thing together. And I looked at it and said, come on, man, really? Like, I'm putting a toy together for you. Can you not, can you not bite me? Like, so I kind of shoo, shoo, little birdie. I shooed the bird away, right? And then so I go to put it back together. And this time it comes up and it, and it bites me. And it bites me pretty good. Like, I can see a mark and it hurts. And so I gently go, bird, I wouldn't do that if I was you. And I push the bird away and I go back to putting the toy together. And then the little bird comes over and it ruffles its feathers. It's going to show me who's boss. And I go, that's a bad idea, bird. And the bird comes over and latches a hold of me. And I go, ow, that, that really hurts. And so I kind of, you know, kind of flick the bird away and the bird kind of scurries across and he looks at me and he fluffles his feathers and I go I wouldn't do that again if I was you so I keep putting this thing together and the bird no lie comes up and it bites me again now before any of you freak out the bird is alive okay <laughs> that bird bit me and before I I don't know what happened but you know I, I something crazy happened like the bird bit me I stood up, I grabbed the bird, I picked it up, and I just slammed it right on the ground. Wham! And it like bounced. Boom, boom, boom. And then like you mean everybody in my family like stopped instantly. Like everyone just turned and looked at me, and the bird was like on the ground. And I just thought, man, I am the best dad ever. I killed my daughter's bird on her 13th birthday. I should get like dad of the year award. And my daughter said, what happened? I go, I don't know, it bit me. <laughs> like, I don't know, it bit me. I got so mad, I picked up something. And thank, thank God, like it, it didn't, its wings weren't broken. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's mostly okay. Um, it's still alive. It's payback. Is this gonna live another 20 years? This was like 10 years ago and I've still got that bird. Um, but here's what I discovered in a moment of anger, I undid a whole day's worth of work. Like in a moment of anger, I ruined the whole day. We had a special day, but in one moment, I undid all the hard work I'd done. And my daughter's like, Dad, you threw my bird down. I said, I'm so sorry it bit me, and I don't know what happened. And my wife looked at me like, man, what kind of crazy person? It's her 13th birthday. And to make it worse, had the bird died in a moment, I would have created a lifetime of pain for my 13-year-old daughter that I could never come back and undo all because I decided to be angry in a moment. And it got me thinking, have you in a moment of anger ever created damage that you couldn't undo? And I'll tell you the truth, as a pastor of over two decades, being a leader in multiple things, as a husband of 25 years, as a dad of 20 years, as a friend of people for decades plus, I've seen the anger monster ruin lives. I mean, here's what, here's what anger does. I mean, ang anger will destroy. Anger destroys careers. I'm telling you, I've known people who were talented. I've known people who were gifted and should have moved up their career chain. I know people who should have been promoted, but I know people that didn't get promoted and they ruined their career, not because they weren't talented, not because they weren't hard workers, but they ruined their careers because they got angry. They got angry at their coworkers. They got angry at their boss. They couldn't control their temper. They used excuses like, well, I just tell my mind. I'm just honest. And they used that excuse to be angry and then they never get promoted and anger destroyed their career. I've seen anger destroy friendships. I've seen in moments of anger where friends have said things and done things that you can't go back and undo, say and do things that you can't unsay that creates almost an insurmountable wall of pain that can't be undone. I've seen anger destroy friendships. I've seen anger destroy businesses. I've known, I've literally physically known people who are in business together who used to like each other and had a thriving business, but they got in an argument and anger was unleashed and it ruined and the business was closed and they separated and they don't talk to each other. I've seen anger destroy families. I can't tell you the number of brothers or sisters who won't speak to each other for decades because in anger something was said or done. I've seen children not talk to their parents and parents not talk to their children because of anger. And I've seen marriages destroyed by anger. And I just wanna apologize for churches over the centuries. You know, church should never condone violence against a spouse. Violence against a spouse is never appropriate at any point. And here's the thing, all these things, you care about them. All these things, they matter to you.
Listen, it doesn't matter whether you walk through the door just to see a funny looking dude and you have no faith or whether you walk through the door because someone invited you and you grew up in a different faith. It doesn't matter whether you went to church or not. Here's what I know. All these things, careers and friendships and businesses and family and marriages, they matter deeply to you. They matter deeply to me. We actually care about these things. But here's the truth that you've experienced. You didn't need to come to church. You didn't mean to tell us. You've experienced it. I've experienced it. We've seen it. It's our opening truth if you're following along in Instagram this morning is this. Acting in anger can feel good. Man, when I threw that bird down, man, it felt good. I just cannot lie. It bit me. But the consequences were devastating, but it badly damages what we love. Acting in anger can feel good in a moment, but it badly damages what we love and what we care about. And then here, I know, this, here's the funny thing. Here's the funny thing this morning. Here's, here's what I know. Some of you, some of you either at Lusby or here at Leonardtown, or even some of you watching, you're going, man, this is a great sermon for someone else. Because I don't really struggle with anger. The monster of anger, I don't have to deal with. That's, that's other people. And you know what? I, I can, you know, maybe you don't have a problem with anger. But here's what I've discovered as a dad, as a husband, as a pastor, as a leader, as a friend, is that most people struggle with the monster of anger. And the reason that you think you might not have an anger problem is because maybe your anger looks different than others. See, we often, and I'm going to put this up here on the screen, we often think anger is only in the aggressive category. We think anger is only when you scream. You know, I'm only angry when you scream and you cuss. And, you know, you see the people, you know, banging on the windshield and you're driving on the road and you try not to look at them because you can see them screaming. They go, ah! You know, you think that's what anger is. Or maybe when it's physical, you know, the person that throws stuff, including birds, and I'm sorry, and you know, kick stuff and break stuff. You think it's just physical or it's just direct. They're the person that flips you off. And you know what? When we leave church, could we, can we not do that? Can we could be nice to everyone, okay? Right? I mean, we, we can get this. We think this is what aggressive, we think this is anger when, it, when we're, you know, when we scream, we're loud, when it's physical and it's direct. But here's what I've discovered and here's what you know is that you can be angry, but it can be passive. How many of us have ever experienced the silent treatment? And they're not being silent. I love the people that go, well, I'm just trying to control my temper. No, you're not. You're trying to be punitive and punish. Either as a parent, either as a spouse, either as a friend, you're silent. And don't think you're not acting in anger. You're being punitive. You're just going to choose not to talk. You may not be screaming or cussing, but you are acting in anger. You may not be physical. You might not break things. You might not throw things, but you'll emotionally get them. You know those funny jokes that you make that actually put someone that you care about down and you do it in front of others and in front of them? You might not throw stuff, but but you create damage. You use words and, and things to harm. And you might do it direct, but you might be subversive. You may go, yep, I promise to do that, but then you don't do it because you're gonna show them that they're not in control and they're not in charge and you're gonna you're gonna make them pay. Oh, you need to be on time? I'm gonna make sure I'm late because I'm gonna make sure I get you back. And here's the truth about acting in anger. We don't act in anger just aggressively. We do it passively. And here's the scary thing. This is why I say everyone in every generation on every continent deals with the monster of anger because anger really isn't about anger. You see, anger is a feeling from a bunch of other things that we already feel, which leads me to this truth that you already know and hear. Anger is a response. You and I get angry when we're Oh, come on, man. You guys can do better than that. Anger is a response to when we're, right? Or when we're, right? Like when we're inconvenienced, we get angry. We do that with our kids. We do it with our spouse. We do it with our coworkers. We do it with our boss. We do it to those on the beltway. We do it, we do it all the time. We do it when we're disappointed, when we get betrayal, when we're ignored, when we're frustrated. Anger is actually a feeling that comes from something else. And here's why I think everyone has to deal with the monster of anger. It's because we live in a broken world where everyone is flawed and no one makes it through life without being hurt. No one makes it through life without being inconvenienced. No one makes it through life without being disappointed. No one makes it through life without being betrayed or ignored or frustrated. And sometimes we'll experience these in one week on a regular basis. Now here's the real problem. Because we live in a broken world and because it's filled with all people, all of us are going to experience this, which means anger is unavoidable. Which leads us to something that we don't ever say out loud, but we already know. Life puts us in a no-win situation, doesn't it? Because we're going to feel anger, but we know anger destroys what we love. We're caught in a no-win situation. I'm going to experience these things because the world's broken. I'm flawed. You're flawed. These things are going to happen. I'm going to know I'm going to feel anger, but I know when I feel anger, it can destroy the very things I love. So what 
do I do? <clears throat> and it's why I'm a follower of Jesus. There's some great news today. And here's the first piece of good news. Everyone just smile. Everyone just smile. Okay, listen, you are not alone. Listen, the monster of anger has been plaguing humanity since the very beginning, Cain and Abel. Like, listen, from the very beginning, anger has plagued humanity. You are not alone in feeling this. You are not alone in acting anger. You are not alone in destroying what you love. But that's not the good news is that everyone does it because that doesn't help you not destroy your life. No, no, no. Here's the good news. There's actually a solution to the monster of anger. Matter of fact, God cares so much about you that Jesus himself addressed this. God knew that every person would deal with this in every generation. And so Jesus addresses this very issue of anger. And God does it not to squash us. God doesn't do it to be angry at us. God does it because he doesn't want us to destroy the very things that we love. So today, I'd like to take a look at the very words of Jesus. We find it in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew. I want to get a little bit of framework on who Jesus is speaking to. Jesus is actually speaking to a very large crowd, and Jesus is giving what is typically called the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus is talking about life and telling people, listen, life is broken, people are flawed, but there's a way to live that brings life. And this is where we pick it up, Jesus, in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew 5. It says, you have heard that your ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Now, I just want to take a quick survey here. Um, any, anybody here, raise your hand if you think murder is a bad idea. Raise your, raise your hand. <clears throat> Great. We're all in agreement. Murder's bad. No one should murder people. And I've run into most normal people, and most normal people go, yep, mur murder's bad. We shouldn't do that. And most of us go, I've never murdered anybody. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, listen, you've heard it said that murder's bad. You get it because you don't want anybody to murder you. You shouldn't murder anyone. It's not good for life. Everyone goes, yep, Jesus, we got that. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus goes and says something else. He says this, but I say, now I want to stop here because do not murder actually came from God to Moses. And Jesus steps in, but I say, and so he puts himself on equal terms with God. He says, but I say, if you are even, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And then he says this, he says, coming, there we go, one more. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Which I'm sure shocked everyone that was like, we get that you're not supposed to hurt people. We get that you're not supposed to murder. But Jesus, you're telling us not to be angry. And Jesus is saying, listen, you misunderstand. What do you think drives murder? Anger. You see, anger is so destructive that you shouldn't execute it. Because if you do, you'll find yourself in judgment. See, we think the only thing that's bad is destroying someone physically. Yet in anger, we'll destroy people's lives. Maybe not physically, but we'll destroy pieces of their lives and think it's okay. And then there was this guy, his name was Paul. He wasn't an original follower of Jesus. Matter of fact, he used to persecute the church. He encountered a risen Christ. And he was teaching people like us, maybe some people who didn't grow up in church, maybe some people who grew up with different faiths, maybe some people who grew up in church but really didn't understand what it meant to follow God. And Paul wrote to a church. And he, he was telling them about the teachings of Jesus. And, and he was kind of talking about the subject of anger. And here's what he writes to the church. And we're going to put up here on the screen. And it's in Ephesians, the church in Ephesians. He said, in your anger, do not. Because the apostle Paul says, listen, you're going to feel angry. Like it's going to happen. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be inconvenienced. You're going to be betrayed. You're going to be ignored. Listen, in your anger, do not sin. Sin just means to miss the mark. What it means is, in your anger, don't get it wrong. When the bird bites you, don't slam it. Put it in the cage and save yourself some damage. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And I've often heard this quoted, and I think this gets misquoted because here's the concept. Like, listen, I, I call it the whole. If you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, you shouldn't make any decisions. You should go take a nap before you have a conversation. I've had people go, hey, if we get into an argument at 930 right before bedtime, like, should we work it out? And I go, no, no, no. And they say, well, what about the Bible says don't go to bed before angry? Well, understand, you can go to bed, but understand it's not really the anger that's the problem. It's the hurt. It's the betrayal. It's the ignore. It's the thing underneath. And you can address that on a, on a good mindset. And it says, this. Get rid of, what's that word? See, it doesn't say you get to keep some. 
It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and with every form of mouse, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. To which we all go, that's great, we should forgive each other. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. But here's the problem, that's not how it works. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. It says we're to rid ourselves of every form of rage and bitterness and anger. Because anger and rage and bitterness causes you and I to miss the mark. Anger causes you and I to destroy the very thing that we love. And so this morning, I know whenever preachers use the word brief, you don't really trust them, and I will try to be brief, but this morning, I want to make three brief observations about what Jesus teaches us and how this applies in our everyday life. And, and here's the first one right here, and it's how we feel isn't what's wrong, it's how we Listen, we're all gonna have feelings. God made us to have feelings. You're gonna feel anger when you're inconvenienced, when you're betrayed, when you're hurt, when you're ignored, when you're frustrated, you're gonna feel anger. It's not the feeling that's wrong, it's how we respond that is wrong. You see, if we're really honest, as soon as we feel angry, we don't actually wanna make things right with people, we just want revenge. If we were really honest, most of the time when we react in anger is we want someone to feel the pain that we Right? Isn't that what we really do in anger? Is we go, you hurt me, you ignored me, you inconvenienced me, you caused me pain, so I'm going to cause you. So I'm going to cause you pain. And it becomes a cycle that never, ever ends. So it's not how you feel that's wrong. It's how we respond. And so are you seeking, when you respond to someone, are you, speaking, are you seeking to pay them back? Are you seeking to restore the relationship? Because it's not how you feel, it's how you respond. True story. I have two daughters, and one of my daughters, I remember the first time we took her to like, what do they call it, like pre-K, little kitty care. It, was, it wasn't like the school part. It was this thing you paid for, and they went a couple days a week, and, and they were little, and it helped you have sanity when you got the kids out of the house, right? It gave you a break, right? So I remember my wife and I, we took off work because it's really important because they don't ever remember that, that you were there at their first little kitty care thing. But we both went together as a family. We took my little daughter to the little kitty care thing, and I can remember we, we brought her in. And she was four or five years old, right? And there was a group of kids, and they were all new, and it was kind of this thing, and she went over to try to play with a toy with a group of kids and they kind of like took the toy so she went over to another group of kids and they didn't know her so they kind of shunned her away and then she went to do something with a third group and they were kind of looked at her and then she just turned over and she started just her face she just she, she looked straight at me she started crying and she ran over and she grabbed my leg and I'm telling you I've never wanted to beat up a four or five year old before in my life <laughs> how dare you treat my daughter so I went over and I just started karate chopping them Whack. no I'm joking <laughs> Was it, was, it, was it natural? Was it normal for me to feel anger that someone would hurt my daughter? Yes. Would it be appropriate for me to karate chop another four-year-old? No. We, we all understand that. We all understand that it creates consequences that are bad. So listen, how we feel isn't what's wrong. It's how we respond. In your anger, don't sin. Don't miss the mark. See, here's what I've discovered, is that you don't have to be angry to set boundaries. You don't have to be angry to discipline. You don't have to have anger to confront people. You can do hard things without anger. It's actually possible. And when it comes to how he feels what's wrong and how we respond, what I've discovered is when I respond appropriately, it's because I stopped being angry and admitted what it is that is really bothering me. See, when you and I admit what is driving the anger, then we can respond appropriately. If your spouse, like we got any married people, do not, do not elbow them right now. Like do not, I'm, I'm helping you right now, right? But if your spouse has ever said something that, like, that hurt your feelings and then you get angry and you're like, oh no, they didn't, right? And you're ready, like you're gonna just let them know. And, and, and the feeling is angry, but what really is driving the feeling is you're hurt. You love them. You want them to respect you. They didn't respect you. You feel hurt. And so what happens is the way that you respond appropriately is to identify, I'm angry, but I'm angry because I'm hurt. Or did, they, did your child inconvenience you? You're angry because you asked them to do something, but they inconvenienced you. Or did, did they ignore you when you asked them like eight times and you finally have to use that voice that you know that you hear in the movies, ah, you know, come do this, and you, you use anger because what really is is they, they ignored you. And what I've discovered is you can respond more appropriately when you identify why it is that you're angry. Because we already said, we already admitted the truth that feeling angry is unavoidable. We live in a broken world filled with flawed people. So it's not the feeling that's wrong. 
It's how we respond that makes it wrong. And it got me thinking, if anger is so destructive, we know that it destroys the things that we love, why do so many, why do I allow the anger monster to come out and create a mountain of damage? Which leads me to observation number two, which is this. Using anger to produce short-term results comes at the cost of punishing consequences long-term. You know what I discovered about anger? The reason that I'm willing to use anger, the reason that you're willing to use anger, you already know this, I don't have to tell you. The reason that we are willing to use anger is because it's easy. It's easy to just let the emotions fly. It's easy to grab that bird and throw it down when you feel like it. It's easy to yell. It's easy to cuss. It's easy to smash. It's easy to ignore. It's easy to, you know, give sly comments. Like, it's easy And if we're really honest, sometimes anger is very effective. I mean, you can get little kids to obey when you use angry voice. But here's the truth about using anger as a tool. When you and I use anger as a tool, you may get short-term results, but it comes with punishing consequences. And you know what? God, before you and I were even born, God told us this. We're going to take a look at two Proverbs. We're going to put it up here on the screen. And it says, those who are kind benefit who? See, you and I often think when we're kind, we're benefiting somebody else. No, 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 you're benefiting yourselves. But the cruel bring ruin on. When you are cruel, when you are anger, when you act out in anger, you're not harming other people. You're destroying what you love. You're going to destroy the relationships with your family, with your friends, with your kids, with your spouse, with your coworkers. Everywhere you go, if you use anger, you're going to destroy the very thing that you are tracing. It doesn't just stop there. I love the next verse that we're going to put up here on the screen. It says, stop being angry. You're going to have the feeling, but as they said in Frozen, let it go. Turn from your rage. Don't lose your temper. It only leads to. See, when you and I use anger as a tool for short-term things, whether it's with our kids, whether it's in our work, whether it's with our spouses, what we do is we create damage. And the problem when we use anger, it's like an assault on someone's dignity. And when you assault someone's dignity, they remember it. You know all that good I did for my daughter's birthday? How I took her to the bird store and spent hours with her. I drove for hours. I paid for her lunch. I took her to a store and bought her some more stuff. We had cakes. I bought her gift. You know that all went away when I picked up and slammed her bird. In a moment of anger, I undid all the good I had done. You may get your kids to obey. You may get your spouse to agree with you. You may get your coworker to leave you alone. You may get your boss to ignore you. You may do whatever you want, but it's going to come with long-term consequences. If I could go back and tell my young self anything, I'd go, do not use anger as a tool in any of your relationships. It only damages the very things that you love. Which leads me to observation number three, which is this. Anger is a strong monster, but the cross has the power to defeat it. I mean, anger, man, anger, woo! One of the reasons it's the top monsters, one of the reasons it would make my top three is because it's power and it's visceral in our lives. When you and I are hurt or disappointed or inconvenienced or betrayed or ignored or we're frustrated, it drives us. And you might be thinking, Matt, you know, you're able to talk about this because, you know, you don't have the same anger problem that I do. You, you haven't experienced the things that I've experienced. And, and you're right. I, I, I don't know your story. And, and I'm sure that your story, as I've talked to many people, all of our stories include pain. But I know what it's like to be angry. My mom took her life when I was nine years old. I got sent to a counselor who was a Christian who was a child molester and stole my innocence. My biological dad took me to the police station when I was 12 and said, I hope you got what you want and left me there. My stepmother despised me. By the age of 13, I was alone. I had no one. And I was angry. The world had robbed everything that a little kid should have. And the world owed me. And I was going to make the world pay. And in making the world pay, I paid. And that's how I got locked up. And I'll never forget one time I was in a group counseling session and and the counselor says, what is going on with you, Matt? And I said, I just hate, I hate everything and everyone. The world did me wrong. And they said, well, what would you do? And I just started breaking stuff. And somehow in a moment, I believe it was God, I realized that the hate that I had for the world wasn't going to destroy the world. It was going to destroy 
the hate that I had wasn't hurting everyone else. I could create heart, but at the end of the day, it was destroying me. It was destroying everything I loved. And then I heard the greatest news to ever hit planet Earth. There's a God who loves us. There's a God whose heart breaks at how broken and how flawed this world is. And God says, don't look at the circumstances to see how much I love you. Look at the cross. And when I saw what Jesus went through to pay for my stupidity and my sin and my wrongness, something changed in my heart. I'm not saying I don't ever get angry or it instantly went away. But there is power to undo what comes naturally because of what Jesus did on the cross. There are days where I go, man, I wish I had that, that fuel of anger, but I, it would have just destroyed me. It would have destroyed my life. It would have destroyed my family. It got filled and replaced with the love of God. And if we were really honest, most of us don't want to hate people. Most of us don't want to live an angry life. But if we're really honest, here's what happens. When we mess up, when we get it wrong, when I'm a moron, when I get it wrong, here's what I want. I want you to give me a pass. I, I tell you, listen, I tell you every Sunday I'm a moron. Like, I, I'm just honest, right? I go, hey, just like you, I am equal at the foot of the cross. I need Jesus just as much as the next person. I'm like, listen, when I get it wrong, I just look at you and go, hey, I'm sorry. I need you to forgive me. I need you to not be angry at me. I need you to not get payback. Would you give me a pass? The problem is that's what we want from everyone else. We want everyone to give us a pass because we hope that they see that we're really not bad people. We just got it wrong. But everyone else has to pay. See, when you and I go through life saying, listen, I need a pass for when I get it wrong, but you have to pay when you get it wrong, that makes us hypocrites. Especially, listen, if you're here and you have no faith or you have different faith, you just get to eat popcorn and laugh at us. But if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, we don't get to get payback because we've been forgiven. Grace has been given We've been given a pass by the almighty God and as followers of Jesus, we don't get to get payback from people. We give them the forgiveness that was given to us. When we feel like responding in anger, we go, I'm glad God didn't respond in anger. He responded in grace and mercy. He sent his son to pay for my penalty. How can I respond in a way that is like Christ? I'm telling you what, the cross has the power to do and to conquer the monster of anger. If I was gonna just condense it all down, if I was gonna say, listen, Matt, what could you say in one sentence? If you could only tell your 25-year-old, 20-year-old self one sentence, what would it be from the, this message? And here's what I would say. If we don't rid, God's not gonna do it for us, folks. We have to rid. If we don't get rid of anger, it will ruin what matters most to us. If we don't get rid of anger, it will ruin what's matters most to us. Listen, I wish I could tell you that when you come to Christ or if you come to church or someone prays for you that you'll never have the anger monster come out again and I would be lying. But you and I can conquer the anger monster. You and I can get rid of anger and bitterness and rage if we choose to. When I was a young follower of Jesus, there was this verse, and it's the Apostle Paul. He is talking to a group of people like us in a church in Galatia, and he, he, he makes this statement to him, and I want to give it to you now. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. I remember the first time I read that, I go, I no longer live. Like, I like my life. I want to be me. I know I'm not perfect, but like, I'd, I'd like to live. I'd like to have a life. And, and what I discovered is he's not saying that you no longer live. There is a you that needs to die. Can I get an Amen. There's a piece of me. Remember the old me keeps me from being the brand new me that I want? We did that series, right? right? There's some monsters on the inside. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, you know the me that destroys the you that you want to be? He says, take that you and crucify it. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I mean, even if you're here and you have no faith or different faith, don't you think life would be better if Jesus, how Jesus lived, is something that you modeled in your life? I need to take the anger monster and I need to put it on the cross. I need to die to self. I need to die to vengeance. 
And then let, let Christ live in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died and he conquered hell and death so that no one here would have to destroy their own life through the anger monster. Now the timer tells me even though I'm not finished, I'm done. <laughs> Close with a true story. Uh, awkwardly enough, after I got out of juvie when I was a young kid, I was about 16 or 17. When I was 18, I got part of this program. It was called the Sheriff's Cadet Program. And I think I was at the oldest age that you could kind of join it because it was mostly for high schoolers. Um, and it was about how to be a law enforcement officer. I figured I couldn't beat them, so I might as well join them, right? That was kind of my, my motto, right? So I went to the Sheriff's Cadet thing, and they used to have these weekly meetings, and it was really cool. I thought maybe I'd go into law enforcement, right? That's kind of what I'd do. And they had this like week long thing up in Boston for all these, like, all these states and all these places would come all from across the East Coast up to here if you were a sheriff cadet. And I thought this would be the coolest thing. So I, I paid money. I went on this trip with this group of people, right? And there was a group of us there. And there was this girl there that I liked. And, and she was cute. And I really liked her. And I wasn't really good at controlling my temper. And I can remember like day one or day two of like this really cool thing where you had all these kids. And there was things you could do. You could like, they taught you how to like do like shoot weapons. And like they taught you like criminal stuff. And they taught you like, they had you do these things where you learned how to do like, you know, crime scene. It was just really awesome. The problem was, like on the first or second day, I got so mad, I punched a concrete wall. And just as free advice, you don't have to put anything extra off it. You shouldn't punch a concrete wall. It was one of those big cinder block walls like here in the school. And I just hauled off so mad. Whack, I hit it. And um, I don't know if you know, I'm strong, but not, not, not that strong. And so I broke two knuckles and I had to go to the ER and I had to get a wrap and I had to wear a cast and it was all jacked up. And I got to do nothing fun that I wanted to do that week that I was at the camp, all because my anger monster got out and ruined the very thing that I wanted to enjoy. And I bet most of you are thinking, man, dude, you are a moron. How do you get to be up front with a microphone? <laughs> Mostly because I tell the truth. <laughs> now we all laugh at me and go, what idiot hits a concrete wall when they're angry to hurt themselves and ruin one of the weeks that they just spent money for? And my question back would be is how many of us do that in our own lives? How many of us act in anger with our kids and harm the very relationship that we're trying to have? How many of us act in anger with our spouses when we want a great marriage? How many of us act in anger towards our friends that we love and care for and want to be in relationship with? How many of us act in anger in our workplace or other places where we'd like to be accepted and fit in and succeed? And then when we act in anger, we damage the very life that we seek. So here would be my encouragement this week is to memorize that verse, Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me and gave himself for me. Maybe if we spent the next couple weeks trying to memorize that verse and memorize what it meant. Every time a monster tries to rear its ugly head, and bring destruction in our lives, we can remember, no, 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 no. I've been crucified with Christ. Monster, you don't get to live. I'm gonna let Christ live in me. There's something else in my life stronger than the monsters, and his name is Jesus. And that's why the tomb is empty. Let me pray. Hey, God, we're so grateful. We're grateful that, God, that there's mercy and grace and forgiveness. That when we get it wrong and we let the monsters come out, all those ugly names, and we bring harm and destruction in the very life that we want, God, that you give us grace and mercy, and it's not found in a pastor, it's not found in a church building, it's found in Jesus. God, thank you that you loved us so much that you're willing to chase after us, to tell us the truth about anger, and to give us grace. May the power of Christ, God, rest in our hearts, so we can experience the life that you died for. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.